Uh, and with that, I'd just like to introduce Oscar Esteban. Uh, Oscar is joining us in transit from the United States, where he was a postdoc until recently, a postdoc at Stanford, um, to on his way to um, Lausanne, where he's taking a new position. And he'll tell us a little bit about that position uh, towards the end of his presentation. And Oscar will talk about knee preps. Um, OK, take Great. it away. Okay, let me uh, confirm uh, my Jupyter Lab is working. Okay, things look okay. All right, uh, so let's get started uh, a little bit with the Jupyter Lab environment. I'm gonna walk you through finding the, the slides. Um, if you go to your uh, left hand panel, um, you will see this uh, curriculum folder go there then uh, you should find uh, a bunch of uh, notebooks under the Wednesday night preps Esteban folder so I'm gonna start with this one because I'm gonna run it in, in a presentation mode I have to do a little trick uh, but for you it would be fine if you just follow through uh, that Clicking, doing double click on the name, uh, you can go through through the work pro, uh, through the uh, notebooks. So, uh, of course, have to reopen all of them. There we go. All right. this loads okay and the magic button okay so we're up I'm gonna present night preps uh, which stands for neuro imaging pre-processing tools uh, the night preps is an idea generalizing from fMRI prep uh, I think uh, at least uh, you probably have heard of it. Uh, if not, it's uh, just a reproducible uh, workflow for pre-processing fMRI. Pre-processing is uh, a necessary task in most of uh, well, computer vision in general, and particularly biomedical imaging processing because or analysis because uh, usually the the sensing devices don't give you data ready for analysis you generally need to do some uh, processing, uh, registering signals and making sure uh, the coordinates are uh, as you expect them in the analysis. Um, sometimes you need to filter out some sources of noise. And all of those things uh, are basically what we do, we call uh, pre-processing. After pre-processing, uh, these images are supposed to be ready for, for analysis. Uh, I, I'm going to thank Ariel for the presentation and uh, basically just add, I've been working on this fMRI prep tool for the last uh, four, four, uh, four years. And uh, thank you everyone. Let's get, let's dive in. So, uh, as I was mentioning, uh, it's not possible to just uh, analyze the data or Oftentimes, it's not possible to just analyze the data as they come from the, from the scanner. Um, there are obvious things like, uh, for example, uh, you are working on a study where you have several sessions and uh, your subjects are coming uh, with, you know, every week. Of course, uh, you're, not, you're not going to get them in the same exact position inside the scanner or maybe there's been a, some adjustment in the scanner. So in the end, uh, there will be obvious uh, displacements or misalignments between the different images. And that brings me to one of the most uh, relevant problems in um, this pre-processing, which is image registration. Uh, image registration is a process uh, that you use to find the alignment between the objects or features in the image. So if you acquire, for example, a functional MRI scan, and uh, you calculate the average time series, uh, you will see that it has the shape of a brain, basically. And uh, then you may acquire uh, a T1 for anatomical reference, and then you do see a brain. If you put them together, 
you probably will not see them uh, well aligned. And image registration will find the brain and uh, move one of those to be aligned with the other. Other tasks uh, we need to cover with uh, pre-processing is the identification of um, spurious uh, sources of the signal. And okay, this is better. And sometimes uh, you also need to fight with uh, some particular artifacts. Uh, for example, typically in diffusion MRI and uh, functional MRI, we find that images are distorted because you need to acquire very fast and the price you pay is uh, some uh, geometrical uh, inaccuracy. Okay. So the idea, of, the idea for night preps, and uh, this comes uh, right away from fMRI prep, is to augment the scanner so that the data you get are ready for analysis. And we like to liken this uh, concept of uh, analysis grade data uh, to the concept of uh, sashimi grade data or sashimi grade, grade fish. Uh, the, the reason why is in both cases, uh, the product is uh, minimally pre-processed and it is safe to consume. So um, basically how we, get, we got there is um, we started with fMRI prep. Uh, it seemed to be quite su successful. And uh, we uh, learned uh, that people were in need of having this kind of off-the-shelf uh, workflow to uh, cover their pre-processing needs. So we thought, OK, there are many pieces of fMRI prep we can uh, identify and use in uh, some other applications, uh, for example, diffusion MRI. So why don't we just uh, take them out, uh, deconstruct fMRI prep, and build a system where uh, we can put all these uh, components shared uh, for the consumption of uh, workflow builders. So uh, we started to do this uh, decomposition and uh, from ephemeral prep uh, we extracted a bunch of utilities we needed. And uh, now you are looking at a kind of cloud uh, or map of all the different tools we consider under the umbrella of uh, night preps. Or uh, more precisely, only those inside the brain um, sketch uh, are really under the NightPreps community. But because NightPipe, NightPable here, and uh, Beats and PyBeats are so necessary for NightPreps to, to work, uh, we need to see them uh, inside this picture. All the changes in those uh, software libraries upstream immediately to, to the rest of NightPreps. And uh, all these tools can be uh, stratified in layers. At the bottom, you can see a bunch of uh, software infrastructure. Those three uh, are the, the first ones. Uh, I think uh, you've already covered in Neuro Academy the three of them at this point. Uh, one of the first I see at the bottom part that is already covered by Night Preps is called Night Transforms. I will get uh, deep, deep into it uh, in this uh, talk. And then the next level is Template Flow, uh, which I will also cover. And uh, then we have night workflows, which is kind of a miscellaneous box where we've been putting everything together and probably we need to figure out uh, a better use of it. But it contains a bunch of things, uh, general workflows used uh, by several applications. It also contains a reporting system, which is very important as you will see later. And uh, some extensions to NightPipe. Uh, that we need to, which are experimental, and we can't push them to NightPipe directly. So we test them here. Uh, the next step uh, in this uh, middleware uh, layer, uh, we have uh, Crowd MRI, which I will speak a little bit if we have time. SDC Flows, which covers uh, this particular problem I was mentioning of the susceptibility distortions that uh, Diffusion and fMRI have. And finally, MRQC Nets, uh, where we are developing some uh, deep learning models uh, for several uh, applications related to MRQC, which is the next tool. Uh, MRQC is a workflow for uh, generating uh, very nice visualizations of the data set 
and, and then you can use those to uh, screen for quality the, the, the data set, every image in the data set in a very efficient way, and also assign them a rating, and also generates uh, some what we call uh, image quality uh, metrics, uh, which, which is a factor of numbers uh, we extract uh, from different ROIs and different uh, um, models we fit. And we then um, put them together or um, crowdsource them, uh, so gather them together in this uh, database I mentioned, uh, crowd MRI. Uh, here on the left, and we are already touching the last layer, the top layer, the end user applications is SMRI prep. SMRI prep uh, is the structural MRI preprocessing tool. It's mostly a wrapper of uh, FreeSurfer, to be honest, uh, although you have a uh, all the options we use to have our uh, fMRI prep. So it also means there's another alternative uh, path uh, for structural processing without uh, free software. And then at the top, uh, the, the two main uh, important, or the, the, the most important uh, applications currently existing, fMRI prep and diffusion MRI prep, the MRI prep. So, uh, night preps are built using three main principles. They need to be robust, uh, and that means uh, robust against the variability of inputs. Uh, so, using bits, uh, we can basically adapt the workflow to any idiosyncrasy of the data set. Uh, because bits encodes every single detail of the data set, it is possible to make all the decisions that previously were made by the uh, operator of tools. Ease of use uh, just follows the previous one because if you don't have to set any parameter manually, uh, then uh, you can be confident of uh, the processing or uh, basically of how you run uh, the, the tool because there's, there, there are less degrees of freedom for you to make a mistake, basically. And finally, uh, the glass box uh, philosophy. If the first two uh, elements work, but the, the tool is completely uh, a black box, so you can't see anything inside of it, uh, there's a big chance that uh, many people will uh, finally misuse the tool. So uh, worried about that problem, uh, we thought that FMA prep and night preps in general really need to let you see into the box and make sure you understand every single corner and pathway of the workflow. And uh, we implemented this uh, with a couple of um, tools. I'm gonna make the font smaller if I can. Okay, we're not missing much. So basically we implemented the transparency via uh, a very detailed uh, visual report that I will show later. And also uh, it, the tool generates a dynamic uh, citation boilerplate where everything, every detail of the preprocessing is uh, put in natural language, including all the reference to all the software and versions that you used. And uh, also a very thorough documentation. So, uh, Based on these uh, three principles, uh, there are some other uh, foundations uh, we want uh, to have for these uh, night preps. Night preps only support bits, and they produce bits derivatives. And this is a very strong principle, uh, which uh, will not probably be a uh, workaround ever. Night preps are uh, bits apps, and that means uh, not only the interface, uh, which is, is uh, sometimes clunky, people feel a bit clunky, the, the FMA prep uh, interface, because you, you need to always specify input, output, and the participant level. Uh, but uh, I think uh, that's, that's been key for FMA prep to be easy to connect to other tools. So if you don't know anything about uh, bits apps, I definitely recommend you to uh, look through it. Documentation at this point is a bit uh, old, although I know they are uh, right now, in this moment, starting to work on uh, updating it. So it's uh, maybe a good moment to wait a little bit and see if the Google Summer of uh, Docs uh, is ended and uh, the new documentation is posted. 
Uh, but yeah, so uh, bit sets. And then, MyProps have to be only for pre-processing. It's been a very common question for, uh, for FMA prep, uh, whether we would, for example, include um, spatial smoothing. And the response has been almost always no, uh, because we don't want to take any action that will uh, then indicate what can come next. Because depending on how you do the smoothing and the kernel width you decide, uh, some analysis will not be uh, will, will not be possible on this data after the smoothing, and that's why uh, we consider that smoothing should be before uh, your analysis. But FMA prep will never, uh, or for now, will never uh, give you the, the smooth data. Uh, the next is uh, just follows uh, the previous one and is uh, at all levels. We try to man, uh, maintain the NIPREPS agnostic to whatever analysis tool you want to run afterwards. So uh, you can run uh, surface analysis, you can run tractography, you can run whatever you want to run after the, the NIPREP. Um, it needs to be possible. Then uh, this is the principle of documentation I've already mentioned. And uh, number six would be that uh, NIPREPs are community driven. And uh, probably the, the most important thing here is that uh, we try to uh, compensate every contribution uh, via publications. And uh, for us, the contribution term means, uh, is, is considered in a very liberal sense, uh, meaning that even if you get involved in a very interesting conversation in the GitHub repo for one particular pull request because you are an expert, uh, you are immediately considered uh, one uh, contributor to the tool. And therefore, every time we are going to publish about that uh, night prep or tool, uh, you will receive an email inviting you to the paper. Finally, night preps are modular, and that's uh, basically what uh, made possible to divide uh, family prep and strip out all the tools uh, we wanted to, to have uh, available for other night preps. And in particular, we, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. Uh, so we tried to use uh, AFNI, ANTS, Fisherfare, FSL, Nightrun, DiPy, uh, everything at hand uh, with uh, permissive licenses and uh, sufficient. Um, conveniency uh, to build containers uh, whenever possible. So let me walk you through uh, these uh, famous uh, FMA prep reports. And uh, we want to have this for every, every end user night prep. Basically, uh, the idea is that uh, it needs to tell you not only whether your processing uh, was uh, OK, uh, you need to learn and uh, understand uh, what that processing entailed. So uh, maybe it's a bit uh, difficult to see, but there's a, a pointer here. In the beginning, it starts with uh, a menu. Uh, I hit in summary, and it brings you to a place where you can see how a frame prep interpreted this uh, data set, uh, giving you general data about the data set. The first panels uh, is showing you the result of uh, part of the anatomical processing, uh, how the inhomogeneity correction and uh, segmentation work. The next panel shows you the alignment to standard space. Uh, this is uh, one particular flavor of MNI. Uh, next is uh, showing you the surfaces, how they were reconstructed. And now we go to the functional MRI block. You have again another summary. And we go to the alignment to the same subject, T1 uh, anatomical image. And you can use those contours uh, as cues to, to see whether uh, registration performed uh, decently. Next step shows you some ROIs for uh, useful for denoising uh, down the line. And uh, finally, some other uh, views into the data and uh, all these uh, nuisance signals that FMA prep puts in a TSV file for you to use in your analysis. When every run is uh, processed or uh, shown, uh, you can jump into about section where you can see the exact version and the exact command line you run and when you did it. 
And this is the uh, citation boilerplate. This is a dynamic dynamic section. Uh, it shows you HTML, but you can also use Markdown or LaTeX if you want to just copy and paste uh, into your paper. And it describes every single step with all the uh, citations. Finally, you go to the last section where uh, if there were any errors, uh, they are reported. So, uh, in the following, I'm going to cover a little bit of this uh, template flow, my prep, which is, uh, if you remember, one of these uh, elements uh, between the uh, software infrastructure and the middleware layer. Uh, Night transforms, uh, which is uh, indeed uh, in the middle of the software in infrastructure. And finally, crowd MRI, which is uh, in the middleware uh, section, but that touching very closely to the end user um, applications. Okay, now I have to switch. We, we are going to jump into the next uh, um, Jupyter Notebook. Uh, this one called 01 Template Flow. Oscar, can I just jump in? There was, there was a question about something that you saw. Uh, someone is asking, in the summary, I saw it is surface driven pre processing. Is it also possible to do a volume driven pre processing? Yes, definitely. Um, you can actually uh, tell uh, FMA prep not to spend uh, a lot of time uh, reconstructing the surfaces, and uh, you will save a lot of time, of course. Uh, but uh, regardless that you do that or not, you always get at least volumetric uh, processing. Thanks. Sure. Uh, yeah, uh, feel free to in, uh, interrupt me at any point. Uh, I'm happy to take the questions as they come. All right, uh, template flow. Okay. So uh, we had to build template flow and I say we had because we, uh, for FMA prep, we faced a big issue when we uh, were asked by the users to uh, make it possible or more flexible uh, what you, you, you can use as a target for spatial normalization. Uh, meaning uh, people wanted to use their own templates or maybe wanted to use a different template from uh, the typical one, which could be the SPM one, uh, MNI SPM, which depending on the version of uh, SPM and uh, what tools of SPM you use, it could be uh, two templates, actually. Or uh, if you are using FSL, MNI is a third option there, uh, and all of them are called MNI. And uh, we realized uh, first, there are many, way many MNIs out there, and uh, we don't know, actually, uh, when you write in a paper, uh, these results are given in MNI coordinates. We don't know really what you're saying uh, because there are so many. And then the second thing is uh, there's no repository where you can, or a program can uh, choose, pick and choose what, uh, what they are going to use. And uh, that was the, the problem for FMA prep uh, because we couldn't pull, uh, we needed to ship FMA prep with all the templates, uh, P packages. And uh, at some point that can become very cumbersome. So we thought, okay, let's uh, split this responsibility and create this tool to uh, at least have access to all these templates. So uh, we started to work on it. And uh, finally, the tool has uh, three main components. Uh, the first component is the template flow archive which is actually the storage space where we are uploading uh, all the templates because um, it's, it, it needs uh, a template flow does some curation of the templates and some normalization. So uh, all of them have uh, similar features in, in their uh, enclosed uh, imaging objects. And uh, we decided to put the load of uh, that curation on ourselves. And uh, only after the curation has happened, we upload these to several places. One is OSF, uh, which offers uh, quite a lot of um, free storage space. And the other one is uh, S3, bucket, uh, S3 buckets um, 
donated uh, thankfully by Russ Poljak and his lab. So then uh, we have a Python client, uh, which is a tool uh, basically wrapping around PyBits to access the, the, the archive because the archive has a bits like uh, structure, uh, the Python client can easily query the, the, the archive and get you every single uh, object or a bunch of them if you want them. Finally, uh, the last component is the template flow registration framework. Um, the vision here, and I say vision because uh, about 10% of this is implemented and the rest of it is just uh, an idea. Uh, the vision is uh, every time we upload a new template, uh, we automatically will run a very, very accurate and uh, costly uh, image registration process against all other templates. This way we will obtain uh, bidirectional uh, transformations uh, from every template and to every template and use them to flow the information uh, across templates. So if you uh, decide to create a new atlas based on your own sample, uh, so you create a custom template and work your atlas in, in there, uh, your annotations are there, uh, using this registration framework, uh, you can then propagate uh, very easily your annotations to MNI and other templates and perhaps checks, uh, check some things or um, just uh, uh, report on a more standard space. Uh, if you want to learn more, uh, make sure you, you check uh, the website, uh, which uh, we are currently will building and uh, new things will uh, come up because we are also preparing a preprint of this. So let's start with uh, the easiest part, uh, the Python client. Um, the idea for us is uh, to make it very, very easy for uh, users uh, in their command line or uh, as I said, in their uh, Python uh, shell to use, uh, to, to retrieve data from, from the archive. Uh, but also from, uh, of course, from software because uh, the Rina idea was for FMA prep to easily access all these templates. So it's as easy to install as uh, just a pip install. Uh, I will just uh, use my pre-cached uh, results here. Uh, I don't want to mess up the presentation. And then uh, we have this uh, submodule uh, API uh, where everything you can do is hanging uh, from. So the first line you will do is from template flow import API. And for instance, uh, you can check, well, what are the templates I have uh, available here? And if you, if you run api.templates, uh, you get a list. You can see a bunch of uh, MNI uh, flavors. Uh, all those in the beginning, starting with uh, MNI 152, uh, are uh, several templates uh, done with methodologies of uh, the uh, McGill Institute based on the ICBM 152 subjects uh, database. And uh, as you can see, there is this, uh, uh, the linear version, which is uh, the one I believe SPM prior uh, eight is using. Uh, then you find the nonlinear uh, 2009 asymmetric, which is the one used uh, with SPM and Artel, and uh, is also the default for FMA prep. Then you have, uh, for example, the symmetric version of that one, uh, which is, uh, with, for example, it only has one uh, atlas, uh, which was uh, recently published in scientific data, the Cerebra atlas. And then you find uh, this one, uh, nonlinear six asymmetric is the one of FSL. This is uh, what uh, FSL and Nylon call MNI space. Then you have, uh, the, which actually, uh, for those uh, who don't know, uh, wasn't done uh, in, in the MNI lab. Uh, it was actually done somewhere else, uh, but using all the methodologies of, of, of the other templates and in collaboration uh, with uh, MNI. Then we have the MNI. Oscar, I'm just gonna, can I just yes. uh, break in here because people have been running into trouble. 
um, okay. not finding template flow. I think template flow is actually not installed on our hub currently. Um, yeah, but you need to run, I don't know if you can, um, if you go back, they should be able to do the user yes. installation. So I, I was just, yeah, I was just uh, going to point out that. So I'm, I'm just, I was just going to stop oh, okay. So if you're running, if you're watching this live and you're running into issues where you're not seeing uh, template flow running like that exactly, uh, that's an yeah. exclamation mark at the beginning and then pip install template. Yeah, yeah, very that's important. <laughs> yes, I'll, I'll take so that also. remember, yeah, remember to use the exclamation mark and the user probably because otherwise uh, you will not succeed. And then it should, the error should come up here. If uh, it's not installed, uh, the, you will get the error here. So hopefully uh, if you, you get to install it, uh, there, will, no, there will not be any problem. You can try uh, locally. Uh, the dependencies are very lightweight. So, so yeah, definitely try at home and, um, and play with it. Uh, there's also some more pointers on the website. Anyway, okay. um, there's a bunch of uh, templates. Uh, for example, lately we are working on uh, fMRI prep versions for infants. And we are particularly using these two uh, here uh, for, for, because they, of course uh, baby brains are really different, uh, not, on, not only morphologically, also uh, the contrast you get from MRI is very, very different. So um, the possibility of success using a template for uh, adults, like uh, these ones, is really small. And then there are a bunch of other uh, templates. Uh, for example, this one is uh, a very old one from 2006 uh, that the ANTS team made for uh, the Mikai challenge of uh, brain extraction, and is really, really good at that. So we use it in, in FMA prep for that. And then, for example, we have this one, which is a, a, a rat brain. And then uh, these two are uh, free surfer, uh, actually not. Uh, FS average is free surfers, and this one is uh, the, the template for uh, HCP coordinates and uh, results uh, compatible with the uh, HCP pipelines, uh, meaning the, the Glasser Atlas, basically. So uh, as I was saying, uh, let's say we want to, to pick one of these uh, atlases. We want to use one parcellation. Um, and how do we do that? Uh, well, think of the of Tal's pipe uh, session and, and see the similarities. Uh, the template name is basically the same, uh, has the same weight as the subject uh, ID for a regular bit structure. And then we have the Atlas keyword uh, to select this particular Atlas we want to use. And uh, if you run this the first time, uh, it will show you here a panel saying uh, downloading the file. If you run it uh, the next time, uh, then you get this uh, basically because it doesn't need to download the file twice. And this path here, which is home.cache dot template flow is the template flow home. We would call the template flow home. Um, yeah, so this is what I was uh, mentioning. Uh, basically, uh, because I am using cached results, uh, you're not, not seeing any difference here, but in your uh, runs, uh, it should be happening. And then uh, let's say we wanted something different. Uh, we want to check. Um, so what, what is the, the uh, template, uh, the T1 average uh, corresponding to the Cerebra, uh, Cerebra uh, parcellation? Um, it's as simple as just indicating uh, a suffix. Uh, and this is uh, exactly 100% the same uh, suffix you can use for uh, bits. So let's uh, get a little bit into the details of uh, the archive. As I was saying, uh, it's a replicated repository. Uh, we use uh, OSF and uh, S3. And it's uh, managed, uh, it's a uh, version control with uh, data. Um, 
We are also right now uh, setting up uh, a workflow for uh, contributors to upload their templates. Um, because right now, uh, the data lab workflow, uh, if you try to use it uh, barely uh, with uh, no tooling, is uh, really difficult. And uh, we identified that that would be a bottleneck for, for people to add their templates. So these are uh, the basically the, the types of data, the data types you can upload. Uh, First, uh, of course, uh, nifty images, uh, which may, will have, they have to have at least one uh, population average of uh, some, uh, for now it's only brains, uh, but it can be uh, adults, it can be uh, babies, it can be uh, rodents. Um, then you can also store masks. Uh, Typically, a brain mask, uh, at least, uh, would be found uh, to make the, the template uh, usable. Uh, but usually, there are other uh, masks or, um, or ROIs uh, in, the temp in the repository, in the archive. Then atlases, uh, mostly parcellations, um, and also transformations. Uh, these transformations are those I was mentioning in the beginning uh, that we obtain every time uh, or we want to obtain every time uh, a new template is uploaded. And these transformations uh, show the path or the mapping to all the templates. So all the previous uh, data types can be mapped onto any other space. Finally, I have to say that uh, the archive, uh, paralleling the session concept of bits, permits to have cohorts. So for example, uh, you can have uh, a bunch of uh, different cohorts uh, for uh, infants because you need to have uh, templates for uh, different ranges of uh, gestational ages. Uh, that's also uh, possible with template flow. Finally, uh, in the metadata si side of things, uh, we support uh, basically all the things uh, supported by bits, uh, JSON, uh, C uh, TSV files uh, containing uh, any, uh, for example, the labels, the meaning of uh, labels of, uh, of parcellations. Uh, there's a change log and license uh, which are necessary. It also allows to, uh, to uh, upload scripts if you used uh, to get ready uh, these files. In addition, and this is available at the uh, website, uh, you can uh, browse the archive and check what is uh, right now up there uh, using the online browser. Uh, this is, as I said, uh, following this link here or uh, just going through the website. So, uh, as I was mentioning before, you can use the Python client or uh, you can interact with Datalat. And although it is discouraged because uh, it's a bit tricky sometimes and uh, you will get a lot of uh, warnings, uh, I have to polish out, but um, it's not hard at all either. Just run Datalat install minus R and this is the super data set name template flow and you will get uh, immediately, or almost immediately, a stop of all the templates available. And basically, this is uh, showing you a local installation of uh, via data lab. This is going to happen in your home directory where you're running the, the Jupyter Notebook. OK, uh, so uh, can you give me one example? Uh, why is this useful? Uh, yes, let's say you use the uh, FMA prep to extract uh, some, uh, to, to obtain uh, pre-processed data from some uh, task. In this case, uh, we're going to use the finger foot lips motor task in the ES114, uh, which is the one Ariel uh, uploaded a couple of weeks ago to open neuro, to the data slash open neuro data set. Under that folder, you will find a folder called derivatives. And under that one, 
you will see FMA prep and a free software uh, outputs. Uh, you can also get uh, the data set from Gnode, uh, which is a uh, free storage uh, space uh, that you can use. Uh, and uh, also the quota is super high, if not unlimited and uh, recommended by many journals uh, for your uh, data. So uh, we're going to work particularly on subject 05. We're gonna use the session test. Uh, this is a, a multi-session multi uh, data set. And uh, we're gonna select the finger uh, foot lips uh, task. So the conversion of that in uh, FNA prep derivatives jargon is this uh, super long uh, file name. Uh, the first, uh, this is uh, one of the, the things we have uh, discussed more about the uh, bits derivatives because names can get a bit long. But basically, up until here, uh, it just is. It's it's just telling you the origin of this file. Um, uh, in the original bits data set. And uh, this bit here is telling us with uh, respect to which template uh, space uh, this file is uh, based. This particular field here is uh, resolution 02. It means uh, this is matched to resolution 02 in the template uh, and the uh, template flow allows for selecting resolutions. Typically, uh, MNI has uh, released their templates in two resolutions. One uh, is one millimeter isotropic, and the other one is two millimeters isotropic. Desk is telling you, FME Prep uh, has run this file through all the different uh, alignments and uh, uh, filtering uh, it does. And finally, the suffix indicates this is a bold file. Uh, these files are found under your home folder in this uh, path. So if we go through this, um, we need to use this OS path, uh, which is one um, standard tool for expanding this uh, symbol, the, the home symbol, from the beginning of uh, paths. And uh, here is the the full name, and you will also find this uh, famous uh, regressors file. Uh, this is uh, a text file, a tabular file with uh, some signals you may want to use uh, for uh, the noise in, in analysis. Um, I have to say, uh, don't use it directly. Uh, please go through FMA Prep's documentation and make sure you understand all the, 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 the huge section about confounds. Uh, there's a lot of work from many people uh, who are really experts on the topic. And uh, even just uh, for out of curiosity, going through that website is going to make you uh, really a, a nice uh, read and a nice um, use of time. So uh, let's say we want to extract a time series uh, using uh, the cipher. 2018 parcellation and uh, the one with seven networks and 100 ROIs. Just because I decided, I, I have decided that's uh, my preferred one at this point. Then we need to find the file matching the resolution of our pod data. So we will need uh, to have resolution 02. And the template, uh, as it is stated in the space uh, key of the file name of the pod data set, is this MNI uh, particular one. So we use template flow in this very simple way. We set the template name, we select this atlas, resolution is 2, it can be O2 if you want. And then uh, if you use the browser, you will learn that uh, the different uh, possibilities or uh, flavors of uh, the Sheffer Atlas uh, are stated in this desk description field. And in this case, it's 100 parcels, seven networks. Uh, let's use uh, 
let's plot this very easily with uh, nylon. Uh, we can use the plotting module from nylon. I just copied these two lines from uh, their documentation. And you can see how uh, this is the atlas. So if I go back, if I manage to go back, um, you see, in principle, um, this is not the template. This is the parcelation. You will have a DSEC um, suffix. So uh, we pass in the file name we get from template flow. And uh, with plot, plot or ROI, uh, we can uh, right away uh, see how this uh, parcellation looks on top of the FSL MNI template, which is the MNI uh, nonlinear six uh, asymmetric. We can also see how uh, that is fitting our data. And uh, to do that, I will first uh, calculate an average of the pole signal because uh, this data set has 180 time points and uh, Nylon will not like uh, if we pass uh, those many time points. He, uh, it, it only wants one time point. So uh, let's average through time, which is done in this line. And uh, wrap it as a nifty image uh, using the bubble. And then we can use plot ROI and tell it to use as background image our new average. And we can see that uh, ROIs uh, mostly overlap the brain. Uh, you can see some uh, misalignment here. Uh, this is most of it is uh, a, a consequence of a susceptibility distortion uh, because for this data set uh, there wasn't any field map and uh, we didn't run any kind of uh, susceptibility distortion. We missed all the information to do that. And that's why you can see this ribbon here uh, going outside of the brain. That said, uh, these uh, very bright areas look also like uh, activity from CSF. So maybe it's uh, the data set is not as bad, badly aligned as uh, it might seem. Um, so let's just uh, extract the time series. The idea is to go for each of these uh, regions average all the voxels inside and generate the average uh, time series. So we have 100 parcels, so 100 uh, time series times uh, the number of time points in the data set. That's uh, very easy to do with uh, Nylon. Uh, you can do that with uh, Nifty Labels Masker. And you can see we use the uh, template flow file name uh, we got. Uh, we're using this standardized because I just copied it from, from Nylon documentation. Um, you have to call fit transform on your data. And if you remember, this data file is uh, the one in the beginning. If you check on the shape of uh, the result, uh, you can see you have uh, 100 parcels and the 184 time points of this data set. So uh, thank you for listening to the part of uh, template flow and make sure you check on the website and I'm going to jump uh, into the next uh, section, which is night transforms. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to throw them now uh, while I'm opening the, the other file. Oscar, could we, should we take maybe uh, like a seven minute break here just to walk around and yeah, why not? Let's maybe take take seven minutes, come back at uh, 10 a.m. if you're watching this live, and then and then jump into the next section just so people Perfect. have it. Perfect. It's on.
Okay. Um, I think uh, I think we're ready to resume. I think you have a couple of questions here. The okay. one is the first one is the do the resolution of the selected atlas and or parcellation need to match the resolution of the data or is it automatically handled by, by the NIC reps? That's the first question. So um, the answer is yes, it needs to be matched. Um, and uh, that's why FMA prep uh, gives you the possibility of uh, writing, uh, specifying what resolution you want to uh, set the results on. are asking. Oscar, sorry, your audio is very choppy just for the recent uh, couple of minutes. Oh, can you sorry. speak again? Yeah, now I can hear you well. I think we all kind of lost your uh, audio there. So you'll have to repeat okay, that. Okay, sorry about that. So the answer is yes, you need to match the resolution. Um, however, there is this uh, pull request or issue uh, open in uh, template flow where we want to uh, using the, the highest resolution of the template, uh, generate on the fly dynamically any resolution you, you pass in uh, that you want. Okay, okay, there was one more question. Is there a way to use template flow to determine the resolution of the bold image, say if you're using older data? Um, so I, I wonder if the question is, I mean, I can imagine doing something like, for example, trying to match it to the template and trying to guess if you if you didn't have any header information telling you what the size is, well, try to fit it to some template and then say, well, the template is uh, you know twenty centimeters long. This is how much the voxels are. But uh, that was would be very error prone in, in my opinion. Otherwise, that that stuff should be in the in the header or in the DICOMs or somewhere. Uh I don't regular. recommend it. Um, <laughs> yeah. You can you can basically um, do a wild guess of uh, what is the what could be the orientation matrix for that uh, particular data set, and then run some registration, uh, allowing for uh, a fine uh, deformation. So so it captures uh, the different in the difference in scaling, and maybe you're lucky. But this is really really not recommended. Okay, those were the questions. So you can you can keep going now, and uh, I'll I'll keep an ear out for when your audio, because your audio is a little choppy. But I'll I'll stop you if the audio becomes choppy. I probably shouldn't have said anything because your audio is choppy right now. Okay, is it better? It is. Cool. So, all right, uh, let's jump into this. Um, I'm gonna talk about uh, uh, night transforms, which uh, was one of the components uh, at the bottom of, um, of the night reps uh, pyramid. And uh, because of uh, some requirements of this uh, particular notebook, uh, we will need to install uh, night workflows first. As I was saying, and work close is this uh, catch-all box uh, where we uh, basically put everything we don't know where to put uh, in principle. And uh, among those things, uh, the whole report system uh, and it generates all these uh, reportlets uh, you've been seeing uh, when I did the rundown through the FMA prep report. Each of those common components uh, showing the mosaic of the brain, uh, sometimes flickering, sometimes uh, showing contours those uh, are called reportlets and they are like uh, reporting units. 
Uh, we also put there all those extensions to Nightbite. Uh, we want to test uh, before upstreaming uh, to Nightbite or downstreaming to Nightbite. And uh, finally, uh, workflows. Uh, for example, uh, the brain extraction workflow of uh, anatomical images, which is based on uh, Nightbite uh, view of uh, ants brain extraction from ants, uh, is there. Uh, for use uh, in SMI prep or any other uh, workflow uh, you want to set, to set up, for example, uh, SMI prep for rodents. Uh, the way to install it, again, uh, don't forget, don't ever forget the uh, exclamation mark there and uh, pip install. Uh, we're going to do it in the user space uh, to make uh, your container, the container you're running, happy. And uh, we will need, in particular, anything above uh, the 1.2.6 uh, version. So the reason uh, we need these uh, night workflows uh, before we start is because uh, I want to show you the reportlets in line uh, here in the notebook. And uh, that's done by this uh, display uh, utility we have in, in night workflows. And now, uh, since we are setting up things, uh, let's install uh, night transforms. Uh, I just uh, picked uh, missing the user flag here. Uh, so remember exclamation mark because we're going to run uh, a bash command. Um, this is the way of telling uh, Jupyter Notebook that we don't want to run Python. Then pip install and then user space and night transforms. Hopefully you will not get any issues and uh, get this 20.0.0 uh, RC3 version installed. And uh, this RC3 means uh, release candidate three. Uh, there's no official stable version of uh, Night Transforms. Uh, this I'm going to show you now. It's, it's going to be uh, particularly experimental. So, night transforms. Uh, it was more as a, a very small project uh, with uh, a very clear vision of uh, completing uh, Night Babel. Because Night Babel is super comprehensive and super useful with uh, nifty files or any uh, imaging file, really, that you want to, to uh, operate on, or maybe surfaces or CFP files. Uh, it really covers uh, data structures very, very uh, thoroughly. But um, because the transforms, uh, spatial transforms, are a some kind of surrogate uh, data with almost never surfaces uh, in the outputs, um, unless you are doing something really sophisticated. Um, Nibabble uh, never covered them. and. Uh, and uh, I think uh, we thought it was a time for, for extending the new bubble uh, with transforms. So eventually, when uh, Night Transforms gets mature enough, we will get uh, integrated into Night Babel. So uh, you said, or I said, spatial transforms. What's that? Um, I guess if you have attended a uh, crisis. Uh, session on uh, Nibable, uh, you know already that uh, images have usually at least two uh, coordinate spaces. Uh, the one is given by the data array, and it is a discrete space uh, with indexes of uh, voxels. Uh, basically, you can access uh, the data by indicating the, the index uh, through each uh, coordinate. And then on top of that, you can define uh, some physical space uh, by giving an extent to each of the pixels or voxels. And uh, because of the reasons I mentioned in the beginning, um, even within the same session, uh, different MRI acquisitions or other images, if, of course, uh, much more if you acquire with a different device. Uh, so you have to do a multi multimodal analysis. Um, the brains or the features will not be aligned. So you run image registration, which is this methodology to estimate a spatial transform that puts the two images into alignment. And it means uh, if you try to fuse the information of both, uh, you will see that, for example, if you have some signal coming from uh, coming out from the eyes, 
uh, you don't have four eyes in the fused image. Uh, you just have two eyes because they are aligned. And uh, I just uh, made a, a little comment indicating you how this uh, methodology is usually proceed. Uh, basically, uh, they uh, look at features and for example, mutual information will be a cost function to lead uh, some registration and uh, it will penalize uh, if there are four eyes in the fused image uh, instead of two. And uh, why is this an open problem? Well, as you may imagine, uh, it's uh, exactly uh, because there's no, uh, really no support or compatibility between tools uh, to support the spatial transforms. Because this is a very um, infrastructural uh, step or data structure, um, usually uh, these transforms don't surface uh, for users to use. Uh, and uh, that means, uh, if you run your pipeline and you need to concatenate several uh, registrations, if you pick FSL for the first one, um, you probably will not be able to run any other registration uh, without FSL. And uh, this was a big problem for FMA prep because uh, we wanted to use, for example, DB register from uh, FreeSurfer to align the port uh, and the T1 uh, image because it's a great software for that. But then uh, we wanted to use uh, ants for uh, the registration between the subjects T1 and uh, sp uh, the, the normalized spaces or templates. So uh, it was really difficult and we spent many, many hours uh, converting from one format to another and uh, with many different uh, problems arising from that because that's very prone to errors. So in the end, we realized that uh, we really need a tool that is simple and makes uh, applying transformations uh, really easy. And because in this New York Academy, we're trying to um, go to the foundations of uh, processing and analysis and software and coding, I believe uh, Night Transforms is probably one of the most uh, appealing projects uh, in the Night Reps uh, umbrella uh, to go through it. So uh, if you have already learned that, you know, images, formats uh, is the wild, wild west or analysis, multiple comparisons, et cetera, et cetera, is the wild, wild west. Uh, right now you are entering the wild, 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 wild west. So let's uh, grab some data. Uh, in this case, uh, the data are under this uh, particular folder uh, on your home. And I'm going to use, uh, I love this um, uh, standard library uh, added and this, uh, this particular bit of the standard library uh, added with, uh, I think, uh, Python 3 and uh, in full with uh, Python 3.7, the full uh, specification. Uh, but yeah, this uh, path object from Pathlib is super, super useful and convenient. And it has this very cool way of uh, writing out paths. Uh, it's really, really easy to, to, to see it. So uh, we're going to use uh, eBubble to see the features of uh, this uh, pre-processed one image I got from FME Prep. And then I'm going to do the same with the uh, bold run uh, corresponding to the same subject, uh, all of them under this uh, BS114. So we load Nibabol, and Nibabol understands uh, these uh, new paths I was uh, fancying before. And uh, we just, uh, this, is, this is containing the, the path I showed uh, under your uh, home folder, and then the file name of the T1. And this is just uh, going to print out uh, the size of the image and the resolution. So you can see this T1 particularly has a matrix of uh, 256 by 156 by 256 voxels. And the resolution is anisotropic uh, in this case, uh, one millimeter by 1.3 by one. On the other hand, uh, the bolt is a bit smaller in matrix size, 
not in physical space because it's the same brain. So it needs to occupy relatively the, almost the same area, right? The same volume. Uh, and because uh, the matrix size is so small, uh, voxels are in this case uh, four millimeters uh, isotropic. So they are much bigger. And so let's uh, plot them together and see uh, basically what happens if you acquire two images and just render them together. Uh, to do that, uh, we first need to adapt uh, one to the size and resolution of the other. So let's pick the T1 as reference and uh, resample, we generate the bold image, uh, but in the size of the T1. And uh, we can use the identity transform because uh, that's an spatial transform, which doesn't move things. We create this uh, new uh, identity transform uh, and we're going to call it or use the variable name identity underscore XFM uh, using the T1 as reference. That's easy as this. We first import my transforms and then from the linear module, because we want a linear transform, why wouldn't, why, why you want we use, uh, why do we want to use a you know, complicated transform when we have a linear model uh, at hand? And then um, all of them are called affine, affine. And here we just say the reference. If we don't uh, write here the matrix argument with some uh, new PRI, uh, it will set the identity transform, uh, transform by default. So you can check it uh, after creating the object. If you check on the matrix object, uh, you will see you have uh, the identity matrix for the coordinates. So uh, resampling an image using night transforms is as simple as calling the apply method. So we, we call apply on the default image Remember, this is the transform object, and we obtain another image, but this, this new image should match uh, the uh, size and resolution of the T1. And yes, that's correct. Now we have the same uh, parameters. Let's visualize it. We use the, the, this display uh, tool uh, that we imported in the beginning, and we use uh, on one hand the T1 as reference, and they resampled uh, in T1 space as uh, the moving image. Uh, and if we hover over the, this reportlet, we'll see the two uh, images flickering. You can see here on the top left uh, corner of the reportlet, you can see how it's uh, flickering between M for moving and F for fixed. And yeah, you can see how uh, on the anatomical image, you see the corpus callosum here, and you can see it here in the functional run. So yes, uh, those brains are not aligned. Let's uh, fix that. To fix that, uh, I'm going to use a pre-run uh, FMA prep um, execution and uh, I stored uh, in your home folder, you will find this uh, little file. This is a linear transform mapping from the uh, bold image to the anatomical image. So we use the new transforms.linear.load function and uh, we set for reference, we set the T1. And now again, we do the apply. If we want to check, uh, we, we check that the resolution effectively is the same as the T1 again. And now if you check on the matrix of this transform, you will see that now it's not the identity transform anymore. So the underlying model of this, oops. Oscar, just uh, okay. to interrupt, yeah. the, the display command, for some people it didn't really display the images, instead it displayed 
the names of the objects in there. But I'm not sure. Huh. Yeah, someone on well, I, I guess I, I can go through. OK, this is happening because I'm not running the, the whole um, uh, Jupyter Notebook. So right. if you want to check on the matrix, you would do this, um, and uh, it should work. Uh, regarding the display, uh, I can try uh, to help over Slack after oh, the, the. Okay, yeah. Somebody somebody wrote in in the Q and A the answer to this. It's about importing okay. importing. It's an import that's missing there, or that wasn't you didn't run it, so it ran some other display instead. Oh yeah, that's right. This, because there's a namespace the, collision with something else. Yes, and, yes, uh, that's probably true. Okay, yeah. I'll, I'll note it and uh, change the name for this display. Great. Okay, Thanks. so we apply the transform uh, with the apply method. Uh, you have it here. So this is the transform object, and this is the apply uh, function, and this is the bold uh, image. And now we scroll here. If we hover the image now, you can see how the corpus callosum roughly aligns. There are still some distortions, and this is uh, this uh, distortion I've been talking about all the time. So sometimes, especially for example here in the ventricles, which gives you a lot of signal, uh, you can see how there's some misalignment here. It's because the pod image is stretched, and uh, you can see the misalignment as well here. So, so that's why you want to fix or uh, address uh, susceptibility distortions. Uh, they are also typical here in the ventromedial uh, prefrontal cortex. You can see here a lot of dropout. Uh, T1 has, uh, has some signal and uh, here there's usually a void in the bold and the diffusion data. And in this particular case, the researchers didn't want to acquire the cerebellum for some reason. Okay, so now we're very happy because now we know how easy it is just calling one apply function, uh, basically loading in a file generated by any software uh, that you run registration with, and then call apply, and you will have your uh, images in the new space. Okay, uh, but uh, can I do the, the, the other way around, basically? Uh, define some ROIs in the subject space and take them to my uh, native space of analysis, to diffusion or, or function. Yes, of course. That would be just inverting this, tra this transformation. So inverting a transform is really easy uh, with uh, the Python default uh, operator for inversion, which is this uh, symbol. Uh, so basically this line is telling, okay, invert this particular transform and write it here in this, uh, under this reference. Now we also need to change the reference because now the reference is going to be the whole data set, not the T1. If we run this and apply the transform, the new transform on the T1, because now we want to, to move the T1 onto the bold, we can see that the reference you can see it on the left uh, corner. The, the functional image is the fixed image, and now the, the moving image is the anatomical image. And again, the images line up. Of course, we are uh, losing a lot of anatomical resolution because now we're using the super big voxels of uh, the bot image. Okay, uh, but can't you do more complicated things? Uh, typically, fMRI reports, uh, they result in uh, standard spaces. And uh, if you had uh, all those uh, registrations done, why, why can't you concatenate them? Well, that's very possible. So, uh, in this case, I'm gonna use a different uh, template because I run it on a different, uh, I, I asked uh, for a different uh, output space or, or calculating a different transform uh, to FMRI prep. And again, uh, we can retrieve the template image uh, using template flow. Uh, I'm gonna get this particular template uh, without any description field because there's a description field for brain images only. And I want the full uh, T1 weighted image. I want the higher resolution one and uh, I want the T1 image. So I run this and get uh, my uh, template. 
and oh, which, uh, I'm going to ask you to delete the second line or don't look at it, but basically uh, under your, um, this is, uh, it should probably have, yeah, break here. Okay, uh, so um, because uh, the spatial normalization requires two steps of registration, one is linear to approximate things, and the second one of uh, nonlinear registration to do the fine tune and, and the final accuracy, um, we need two transforms to allocate this. And uh, we represent that uh, with a transform chain in uh, the language of uh, nine transforms. So, uh, a loader, a more convenient loader is not yet implemented, but uh, you can do this. Uh, this is copied from, or this interface is the same as, uh, as that of uh, Nibubble. And uh, here, this file contains uh, a transform, a, a chain of two transforms uh, calculated by ANTS uh, to move data from T1 weighted space, so the anatomical reference, and uh, onto the MNI space. So we load in that transform, uh, forget about the second one. Okay. Uh, okay, I, I just said this. Uh, so basically we're going to see the first step of the transform. So this was our transform object. We select the first step and we're gonna call it the linear component of, of, of the transform. And if we apply that linear component on the T1 using the MNI as reference, we can display it and see how uh, the, right, the brighter one is the template, is the MNI space, and then uh, the darker one is the subject. And you can see that, uh, you know, the main roughly contours of, of the brain, the, the skull are roughly aligned. Um, and then you can see some difference in the middle, but this is because a linear transform doesn't have enough degrees of freedom to uh, fit uh, these areas uh, so well. Uh, and that's why you have a second uh, nonlinear component. So um, this is a bit tricky. Uh, there's some, to remove this, here you see, uh, because uh, Night, night transforms is experimental. I had to manually uh, split uh, the, the internal transforms and generate this file uh, for the nonlinear component. Uh, hopefully, we will fix this uh, as soon as possible. But this is just uh, the nonlinear component of the initial transform I was showing. And uh, we, write the, we create this object for the nonlinear component and we apply it after the initialization. You can see we, I'm using the reference to the initialized image. And now we can see that uh, the subject is fitting much better uh, the features of the template. Uh, if you want to check on the, uh, in this second step of nonlinear uh, transformation, uh, uh, we can render uh, the initialized uh, subject image and uh, the subject image after applying the transform. And you can see how uh, this is without, uh, this is just initialized in the beginning and then uh, when it looks like the template, it's, it's because we have uh, moved the information within the brain to fit uh, the features of, of the template, corresponding features in the template. This is basically showing the result of an image registration process. Okay. So, well, we have all the transforms uh, from uh, Bold, stepping in the middle uh, with the T1, and then we have the, the template. Uh, why don't we uh, do the, the full thing together? Yes, you can. Uh, just use the uh, concatenation operator of Python. So the pass signal, uh, symbol. And we have the first uh, transform we want to apply is from Bolt to the T1. The second one is uh, from the T1 to MNI, the linear uh, section. And then finally, we have the T1 to MNI nonlinear. 
So we put them, we concatenate them together. This uh, parenthesis will give us another transform object composite of the three. And then we call apply. And we call apply on the bold uh, image directly. And we are going to compare directly to the template. So MNI, MNI. And as we can see, uh, now can, we can see the bold uh, data set fairly well aligned to, to the template. Still, some of the distortions here, for example, are uh, more exacerbated uh, because of registration. But you can see how the corpus callosum is roughly fitting. Okay, so I'm going to recap Oscar, now. I have a question and it came up also sure. in Slack. How, how do you make the, the images flip between the two views? You hover over? Ah, so that's a very uh, finicky trick uh, in SVG. Those SVGs has, have a JavaScript embedded, embedded in them. Yeah, but technically just, uh, just when viewing this, uh, just by hovering the mouse over, you make it flip back and forth? Yes, because uh, there's uh, this JavaScript uh, listening to the Hoover uh, event of the browser. And then uh, yeah, that, triggers, that, answers, uh, that answers the question. Uh, somebody was wondering, they noticed that sometimes it flips back and forth and sometimes it's static. And the difference is your mouse is over it. When yes, it correct. Uh, it's only when uh, I hover it. Great, thanks. So uh, we created night transforms to provide a Pythonic uh, interface to manipulate the spatial transforms and apply them and move images, uh, move data, move coordinates, everything. And uh, we want it to be a compatibility uh, tool across uh, software. And uh, for, for that reason, uh, this project is, is really fun. I really recommend you, I'm gonna do in uh, the next uh, slide or next two. Um, but uh, because we want uh, to ensure this compatibility, it's been uh, test-driven development. Uh, right now we have a 98 or 99% of uh, code coverage with uh, tests. And uh, for most of the cases, we first write uh, the, the code of, uh, for example, we want to read from AFNI and uh, apply uh, and convert it to ANTS. And uh, we first write the test, uh, making sure uh, it works. And then we write the code. So I really, if you are looking forward to join some uh, open source project, Night Transforms is really fun. And uh, we're trying to exercise our uh, engineering so let's go through uh, what happened underneath. Uh, we offline, somewhere else, using FMR prep, uh, we found some spatial transforms. Those spatial transforms are a data object uh, giving you a mapping from one uh, fixed space you take as reference onto a different uh, space uh, called moving, uh, because that's uh, the image that will finally end up fused on top of the reference. Then, uh, if, you, if, if your uh, objective is just uh, to map coordinates, uh, for example, you define a contour on this uh, image on the left uh, and you want to move it to, to the right, uh, you just uh, do this um, map function here and uh, it will give you the coordinates of that object in this other space. Uh, but if you want to bring the information here, which is what we usually understand by applying a transform, uh, then you need to, to take this three-step uh, procedure. So uh, to make, uh, to bring all the information from this image to this image, we need to go through, iterate over all these crossings here, all these voxels, and find their mapping in the, in the moving image. So it's uh, sometimes uh, confusing, and uh, many, many people are confused by this because uh, in reality, the mathematical, uh, the direction of the mathematical transform is reversed. It's not uh, from, uh, in, the, in the example I, I showed before, it's not from the bold uh, to the, 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 the MNI template. It's, uh, and on the contrary, it is from the MNI template to the bold. Oops, sorry. And then the last step is uh, because uh, our voxel in the fixed space fell somewhere off grid, we need to do the, um, an interpolation and calculate a value here, considering the value of the, of the data in the neighboring voxels. And uh, that can be done with apply. 
which is uh, the, the function uh, that I showed before. So every time I was using apply, in reality, it was using the map function underneath, which is the, really the, the mathematical operation of uh, calculating the transform of coordinates from one space to another. And, and this just uh, basically calculates a value here in, at this location and then creates another, another data array and fills all the empty voxels with the values brought from the moving image, which is this one here on the right. So this is the, the website for Fortnite Transforms. Uh, I definitely recommend you to check uh, on this uh, because of uh, the test-driven development approach uh, we're taking and also because um, it's uh, really easy to see uh, really basic things about uh, processing. So if you want to learn uh, low level uh, stuff, uh, this is definitely uh, the right place. Uh, you will also see how we use uh, Sci SciPy and we use uh, NumPy um, at a very low level. So it's very interesting. And with that, uh, I want to say thanks. And I will jump, uh, I will skip over the crowd MRI thing. Uh, you can play around this one on your own and uh, skip over uh, the references and an announcement. Oh yeah, the open so, PhD position. Uh, do mention yes. the <laughs> position. So yeah, for references you have here, basically a compilation of things um, uh, we have uh, already published. Uh, definitely check out on, on the uh, NIPREP's website, Complete Throw website. Uh, there will be a preprint soon, as soon as uh, uh, Rasko and I uh, get together after my travels. Um, so really interesting times uh, to join all these projects. And then, yes, uh, there's a, an open PhD position uh, to work with me in Lausanne, starting uh, as soon as you can. Um, and there will be a lot of uh, functional and diffusion acquisition we will be, we'll be looking at the processing, evaluated different uh, alternatives and the reproducibility and uh, also the regime uh, where things work and don't work, uh, mostly focused on connectivity analysis. So please contact me and uh, yeah, thank you. Th thanks very much for, for listening. Thank you, Oscar. There's one more question in the Q&A. Uh, the question is, if you want to match the parcellation to the data with knee transforms, which, is, which of them would you treat as static and which is moving? If you're resampling, um, right? Because your, you're gonna to have to do some resampling, which space should you do the resampling into? So I'm gonna to try to answer the question by answering a different question. Uh, we wanted to create, uh, one of the reasons why we created Night Transforms uh, was because uh, we wanted from a prep to give you time series. So we really need to implement that use case and uh, for us it was important to allow the user to set any arbitrary uh, resolution for their data or even if you can work on your uh, original native space uh, the better so uh, the idea or the plan is uh, to uh, bring the high, highest resolution annotation you have or parcellation you have into your uh, data space that said Resampling things uh, continuous, uh, continuously, uh, sorry, uh, discreetly valued uh, images uh, is really tricky. So, uh, and there's no uh, really, there's no utility in SciPy to solve the problem well. So at this point, Night Transform uh, doesn't offer you this kind of uh, interpolation that would allow you to, to give you high confidence uh, values, discrete values for your parcellation in the, any random uh, arbitrary space you want. But at some point, that's the, the vision. Yeah, that's, that's a great answer. Thank you so much. I'll give another few seconds for people to ask other questions if there are other questions on the live Q&A. Uh, otherwise, we'll, uh, we can continue discussing this on Slack and on Neurostars, where we'll have a, a topic for this uh, video. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. This is really cool stuff. And I'll stop this here. Thanks a lot, Oscar. Okay. Thank well, thank you for inviting me and thank you for listening.
And yes, if you are uh, willing to do a PhD now, uh, Switzerland is the best place in the world for, <laughs> for a PhD, I would say. <laughs> right. And if it's with me, uh, the better, but uh, that's up to you. <laughs> All right.